for this podcast, we're going to open up with asking people to donate to my Patreon page. That's uh, patreon.com slash challenge history. As we always say, it's between $1 uh, and $100. So $50 and $100 are going to, once there's enough people to add up to it, there's going to be uh, a giveaway that's going to be start yearly, and then we'll uh, make it more common. 50 is going to be the Roman silver coin, 100 the gold Byzantine coin, and for the 25, 10, and the base $1 levels, we're going to uh, add things on there for giveaways on those when we get enough people, and it'll be dependent on how many people we get on those levels. And with this, uh, today's thing is going to be on establishing a real green energy plant. Now, people are going to say, well, aren't uh, libertarians and uh, conservatives against green energy? Well, not necessarily. It's just they, they, want, uh, they want one that's going to be feasible. They do not want to basically use one that's based on unicorn farts. Sorry for the insult, but we have to use one that's based on reality and one that's not going to do more damage than uh, than we do currently have at uh, our current energy, energy system. Now we need to understand that the fact is is we have a system that uh, uses uh, problems that have other issues with it. We've got to understand that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. When we have uh, actual growth in uh, plant-based systems such as rainforest they'll, they'll actually exhibit very very high levels of carbon dioxide and it actually stimulates growth so we know carbon dioxide is not a pollutant it's actually and actually they exhibit higher levels of heat in those regions because of the effects of uh, if you look at the base levels of the regions because of the effects of bacteria has nothing to do with the impacts of the carbon dioxide but merely from the effects of bacteria and what happens when plants die and they regrow you'll actually notice outside of those uh, outside of those areas with it when you go higher up with it or outside of those areas where this bacteria is reacting is you're not going to have as high temperatures from those uh, points and that's directly from that because it's because the as bacteria starts to uh, uh, decay certain organic organisms that have basically died and uh, and it develops uh, into organic fertilizer for the next uh, stage of life for uh, different uh, organisms within the actual ecosystem of that uh, rainforest it will actually uh, it, it creates essentially the recycle of the whole life system now this is what a lot of people don't understand now if you remove carbon dioxide you're essentially removing a core component and we actually have an actual mathematic component that actually shows the reaction between uh, these uh, beings whether terrestrial or not because we got to understand marine life is not terrestrial and what we have with the actual uh, plants themselves we have the co2 the uh, the co2 is given off by the terrestrial li terrestrial and non-terrestrial life and uh, that's actually uh, interjected within the uh, plant life the plant life essentially gives off O2 which means that the difference is that they take in carbon and this is what ends up happening and it's actually just a simple mathematical equation so what we need to understand is what is what are these other uh, chemicals we want to avoid this is basically such things as sulfur we understand when uh, Sulfur, when actually sulfurous gas, uh, sulfurous uh, mixes with uh, mixes actually with rain, we actually essentially create uh, 
sulfuric acid, essentially a uh, low molarity of it, which is essentially uh, what we would view as, for, uh, for in layman's terms, essentially a low potency. Most people call that acid rain. And this can actually happen when we uh, burn, uh, burn coal that's actually higher in sulfur. And eventually we're going to get to that point when we do that. This is why we need to screen out uh, the sulfur from the coal. This is why we have certain screens for this. Now in other countries such as China, such as India, such as uh, North Korea that might not do this, they really don't care when it, what happens with this, you're going to have problems. And it's going to cause issues with uh, not only people, not only animals, but also with the erosion of roads, buildings, and the like. And I mean, we've already had issues with uh, in India with the Taj Mahal actually having some serious problems because of this. And they've had to do massive repairs on it because of the of the effects of this and that's directly from that we also have problems with mercury now mercury is not coming as much from the coal but uh, rather from an effect of uh, a mix of what we've done with coal and what we've also had with some of these new uh, forms of uh, green energy such as solar and such as wind because these are byproducts thereof and these have actually been able to pick up and this has been an offshoot of it you have mercury is actually a byproduct of these and we need to be aware of this now you'll actually see with this why this has been a big problem now they've mentioned uh, for this on the idea of fossil fuels for uh, on, like so, on like a solar plant, on like a solar panel farm. Uh, the T. Boone uh, right here from Mises for wind and solar with it, they argue on the point of this idea of a solar panel farm. And a solar panel farm would be about 1,200 square miles for a single plant. Now, just to show you, the city I live in is Racine, Wisconsin. Racine, Wisconsin, uh, is actually nowhere close to that large. So we'd have to go out to the actual county. The count, Racine County is actually about three quarters of that size of what would be required <laughs> for a uh, solar panel farm. That means it would cover more than just that. It would actually cover that and either part of either Kenosha County a good chunk of Kenosha County or a good chunk of Milwaukee County. Now that's not a good idea for of uh, for basically running what you would need for green energy. Now you could do the alternative which is this is where we get to the idea of why we're talking about a sensible good uh, green energy plan and a green energy plan that would work which is comparing that to nuclear energy, which would only require one square mile. Now, one square mile could easily be done in Racine, Wisconsin itself, the actual city. Not only the county, but actually the city itself. And when we know what we know about that is basically is one handful of uranium contains about, uh, these are the facts, that one handful of uranium contains the same uh, energy as one 100 box cars full of coal um consumption of energy creates more energy not less this is actually a big plus that's something that actually makes it green um and basically is despite the years of government subsidies uh regulators for instance uh, have forced utility companies to buy renewables uh, these same renewable energy sources are only about 0.9% of the total electricity. The most efficient uh, solar panels currently in use, uh, and that's on the space on our uh, international space station, are costly, and their conversion efficiency is about 20%. Mind you, this is on our space station. This is out in space, and uh, which is not very much. That's about 20%. That means the ones we actually have on Earth are nowhere close. 
12 miles of uh, reflectors ref uh, generate about 300 megawatts, a minuscule amount. Therefore, those reflectors must be kept squeaky clean, maintained uh, to the hilt, or they won't work. This makes it a huge problem. So it doesn't matter if you have it as an independent person at the top of your house, or if we're talking about a solar panel farm. This means if, uh, if we're talking in a solar panel farm, if birds do their business on top of that solar panel farm, this is going to essentially cause a reduction in output. Or, and they also, also there, we're not talking about this, but also the reflection of that as, uh, in certain areas when they've tried this, they've also caused near plane crashes such as the one out in Nevada which is caused uh, which has actually caused a near plane crash and that was actually what they're fighting uh, to throw people off their land for at the current level of technology no conceivable mix of solar wind or wave can even meet half the demand of our energy this means that there is no possible way that the current level of any type of hydroelectric levels of solar and levels of wind could ever do what uh, no matter where they put them could ever do what they need and they go uh, and they point up here with it if, if they become more efficient uh, uh, they, they could essentially uh, uh, become something re uh, usable in the future but as of right now with it we're talking that they are not usable as of uh, actual uh, points right now and one thing is is you have to understand with these you can't uh, green energy as of right now it doesn't have an actual storage point um, wind itself would need a constant backup as what we call as what they're calling a spinning reserve um, well hydroelectric with it is a, is a definite uh, benefit uh, it's what it call it's uh, it's a basic uh, it's a basic uh, uh, problem that it doesn't develop enough and there's limited spaces you can put them now Hydroelectric or ba uh, windmills are essentially taller than the Statue of Liberty, and they're uh, and they consider them as loud with it. And the Audubon Society, as we'll get to later with it, refers to them as Condor Cuisinarts, and we'll get to that point a little bit as well. And because of what they do, now when we look to uh, the idea of a nuclear plant compared to these wind farms or or anything else it's basically the amount that they take up is very very small on a platform platform in comparison even in comparison to uh, what you would need for coal is they generate a gigantic amount of energy in a very very small space which which you're talking wind and solar cannot come close to even anywhere remotely and we know that uh, when it comes down to the, actually the cost and where where we find with it is people tend to uh, people tend to go oh but there were these meltdowns in X Y and Z. Well, the fact is is uh, is we're talking that uh, these were actually uh, basically uh, causes of uh, Basically, first of all, they were overblown by the groups. Number one, number two is uh, is that uh, these were essentially uh, uh, such as like in Three Mile Island, that was essentially a failure of the communist state, and that was really what it was. And. Uh, And then there was really, uh, a, and when it comes down to it, when we're talking at uh, at uh, all these points with it, is there's really not much of a uh, issue when we when we're talking about uh, 
what they try to talk about with these things is it's they tend to think of the people working at these nuclear plants are like the people on the Simpsons and this is the whole point and this is where we get to is and this is where it gets to and you need essentially what what it requires is basically a lot of in a lot of cases it's just uh, fresh water and as long as you're having fresh water and not uh, salt water going into it because as people should realize uh, salt will cause it to heat up as if you've ever wanted to uh, change uh, basically melt ice or uh, to adjust the temperature of uh, water when it's boiling uh, at the, for the boiling point you basically use salt so as long as you're using fresh water to uh, in the system to deal with the reactors there should be no problem as long as and as long as they're running a length of the lines to deal with it because this is what happens in these facts and the other fact is when you have incompetence and that's where these things come from now the uh, now the points of what we would call waste well there is no actual technical waste this is the whole point is what we're what people call waste is actually used for uh, is actually used for uh, medical uh, nuclear medicine. This is one of the uh, this is the big uh, big problem that no one actually wants to uh, admit, and this is where we've got a lot of this uh, irrational fear. And we've gotten to the point is uh, is we're talking basically they're talking right now with it is uh, from the Department of Energy that this is basically from their numbers within they they basically cited that over 40 percent of the medicine now is nuclear medicine and that's of all the medicine out there that we're, we're currently doing in our country so if we essentially uh, go with the idea of we don't want these uh, nuclear plants we're essentially going against uh, helping people. This essentially is not only does it help people in this country because it's not just for people who need chemotherapy, but there's other types of uh, things. Like when I went, uh, when I had to go in for a HIDA scan, which is uh, to uh, when you're doing a scan over the uh, uh, or the organs uh, so that can include the gallbladder and other areas, they have to run. Uh, it's a, that's going through nuclear medicine. They're essentially running a uh, a dye that's based uh, off of this uh, radioactive uh, material that they're running through you. That essentially uh, does not have the uh, that has already gone through. Uh, it's uh, setting so it's basically it's perfectly safe to be injected through and they inject it in and they run you basically there and you're sitting there for several hours and they basically uh, look at the visions to make sure that uh, your gallbladder can gallbladder and your other uh, organs and your GI system can pass these things through safely and uh, it, it eventually just passes through your system normally so you don't have to worry about it And they need this uh, as uh, they need to use a nuclear material because they need to make sure it gives off uh, a fluorescent light, or I should say, uh, light with it uh, that's a uh, bright light, so they can actually see it. And uh, when they you do uh, their uh, when they do the vision in the photos to make sure that uh, the percentage is getting passed through is proper. And uh, and make sure that it shows that the organ is healthy. Now, if they didn't have this, we couldn't uh, we could not do this, and that's a major problem. And this is in a lot of different things. I mean, we have those. We have there's a lot of things from uh, that. There's uh, MRIs with uh, with contrast. We have to consume uh, essentially what's a radioactive material that you're consuming and that works through its system as well 
and that's another thing that's uh, that goes through this whole process and I've had these uh, ones for uh, both the head and neck and uh, for the lower back and uh, for the upper G upper GI area as well so I've had these CT scans as well which are very very important for the CT scans with contrast and they also run a what it called they also run an actual dye through as well and these things are very very important and this dye is radio is radioactive as well and these things are very important to get the uh, vision correct to get the actual photos to come out correctly so you can actually see a full 3D image and without these uh, without uh, the nuclear uh, uh, plants giving off this so-called waste you wouldn't have this and this is the only waste it is the everything else gets actually recycled in the system now when people try to say with the uh, people try to say oh what about uh, the uh, wind turbines aren't they great with it well the fact is is it's green energy but guess what you basically it's pretty much <laughs> like throwing a bird in a blender and that's and it kills between 140,000 and 320,000 birds each year and the fact is is when we have more than about 49,000 of these turbines you can see that it's, it's basically killing about uh, between 5 to about 15 for each unit each year pretty much on average you could say that they kill about one a month each one of these turbines no matter where uh, no matter where they are in the 39 states that they exist I mean there's plenty in my state alone if my state would basically make a commitment to get rid of both coal and uh, these turbines and go straightly to nuclear energy we could actually get rid of this and save the birds and uh, make it so that we don't have to have these large things around uh, the of these of either thing and make it so we can just have these nuclear plants and it makes for a lot of uh, very very high paying jobs and for people like me who actually like watching birds out there I mean it's something that you don't want to see birds you don't want to see these beautiful birds get killed then when you look at the hydroelectric I mean people say oh but what about hydroelectric for ones that advocate for that well guess what that's the whole that's a problem as well this dumps a lot of mercury into the system which is very very bad for fish so for you that like to eat fish guess what those from hydroelectric dams areas around hydroelectric dams they're going to be loaded with mercury and that's number one number two is when it comes down to it is these areas that are hydroelectric dams because of the way they actually block off the area and how they send fish through it goes back to the idea of what wind turbines do it just does it a lot worse it's like sending them through a basic uh, co uh, farming combine and it chops the fish up and this is the whole problem with it and you're making the things a lot worse and they go oh but there's problems with uh, with nuclear nuclear you can have these uh, you can have the meltdowns well the fact is is you can have problems with any of these forms of energy because with every form of energy you're dealing with energy itself energy itself is very very dangerous and this is the thing you need to understand and you anytime you're dealing with energy that's actually uh, that's actually efficient it's very very dangerous and that's the whole point people go oh but uh, you aren't going to find uh, solar panels aren't that dangerous well solar panels actually give off uh, mercury into the system and mercury is very very dangerous because we know the effects on the human body from mercury they give actually dietary restrictions on the amount of mercury that children can have for a reason because it causes brain damage and there's reasons why they do it and they uh, and there's 
because of what happens. Now, if we want to actually be smart about this, we would say, okay, we're going to be smart. We're going to be looking at what's actually productive. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have, uh, and you shouldn't have uh, a uh, a thing like uh, solar panels in your house with it, and, and telling you you should never have that, and you're contributing to uh, the uh, things like the uh, damaging the environment or, or going with anything like this. I'm not going to tell people that because that's insane. But when we're talking about this, we need to be realistic where we are today. Now with heating, obviously right now where we are today, we need to understand realistically that we're at a place to where uh, we really can't go without the things of using uh, something such as natural gas. The thing is, is being that we don't have that many states that would require a great deal of this for many months, it's not going to be much of a problem. And the other times is it's only going to be used for such things as cooking, which is very, very limited, or possibly drying clothes. That's going to be very, very limited in usage. And guess what? That's a small fraction. So if we could actually get to the point of actually taking the electrical usage and taking that, which is the bulk of what we actually have an issue with. I mean, if you look at what's the actual power usage we're talking about, it's not the actual gas usage that is actually the problem. It's the electrical usage that we should take care of. What's... Uh, the gas usage, even with people who use electric ranges, even the most powerful electric ranges, we're talking that's a fraction of the issue. And that, that should be what we need to worry about. So what we need to worry about is the elect, uh, is that's not what we're worrying about. We're worrying about what we do with electricity. Now cars, okay, we can actually deal with uh, those in a different way. That's, we can, instead of going with electric cars, we can actually be very, very simple with this with getting a gasoline alternative. This is where I've talked uh, about actually when talking about energy policy in my uh, public administration degree, I actually proposed the idea of going to uh, liquid hydrogen. Now liquid hydrogen reacts very, very similar to gasoline. It's just a lot more efficient and the output is a lot more efficient and it the only thing it gives off is pure distilled water it just gives up pure h2o as its actual uh, uh point of what it gives off now this could essentially go to uh any type of usage within the car that it would need water and there's plenty of points at which it could do this uh for the way they want to use it and that, but that's, uh, but when it comes to action, so you would basically be left with the only types of usage would be the, uh, for energy, would basically be using energy for actually heating and heating and cooking. And if you're limiting it down to that, there's, there's some excellent ideas. Now, people do like the idea of induction, but induction does limit your idea, your points of what, what uh, items you can use on the top. Um, though we could actually adopt the idea of uh, developing more dual fuel ranges. This would essentially eliminate the uh, problems with uh, trying to uh, cook, uh, trying to bake goods in the bottom with uh, when they should have a dry environment and uh, when uh, all, all your gases as met. We're talking natural gas or propane would naturally create a moist, moist environment because they react with the actual uh, water in the air, and they create uh, they create essentially water vapor on the food, making essen uh, essentially making a lower quality product. This is why when they do baked goods in uh, restaurants and bakeries. Why they prefer electric uh, ovens and they'll actually separate them from the regular ovens they use.
or from the actual range uh, ranges they use. So that uh, this is where uh, this is why we could actually adopt the idea of maybe going with uh, establishing some dual fuel, some companies making more dual fuel ranges that will adapt to what we need. There's other efficient things such as uh, that we've come up in the past with uh, convection cooking, which makes food cook faster and more efficiently by just adding uh, adding a fan and a third source of heat which allows you to cook food uh, quicker without uh, really using that much more energy. And then when, uh, so we could actually do this with limiting the amount of natural gas used because the natural gas could then be only used in the stove top and drying. Now, if, if uh, we get to the point of electric drying being a little more efficient in the future, uh, and elect, uh, then we could essentially adopt that, but uh, we'll just have to get to that point. Now certain people prefer electric drying as well. I mean I believe uh, that's what we're currently using at this sta at this stage in my in my house right now. So many people might might adopt to that as well when it comes down to uh, the case of the uh, uh, stovetop you're going to be kind of stuck with it because people are not going to want to give up the idea of aluminum pans or pans that are based off aluminum or non uh, uh, ferromagnetic materials and that's going to be a pro and that that will make make uh, the idea of induction not uh, plausible but uh, for everything else it makes it a very very easy to use system when we go to uh, the idea of cars, you could have uh, certain cars that are electric, and you go to other cars that you can remain as where you can get the benefit of uh, liquid hydrogen and drop the usage of gasoline. Now, this would mean that basically you have the only source of uh, fossil fuels would essentially be uh, natural gas. Now, would we still be using coal? Yes, we would, but the coal would actually only be used for the production of uh, steel. And that's what we're going to have to accept. We're going to have to accept that coal is always going to be used. Now, is coal a re renewable resource or not? Technically, it is because when it comes down to it, the way, we ha the way it's made, it is made from uh, dead organic life that gets compressed and that's how that's how coal is formed and it's formed between the actual layers of the of ground and this is where it actually is formed and we have and as the planet is uh, ages from generation to generation to generation more and more coal is formed it's not going to stop theoretically you would have to have a dead planet for that to stop it would just have to be just a blank ball of rock and there would have to be no type of plant life or animal life for that to occur. And that's why we'll never hit that point. That's why we're not likely to hit that point. As long as humans exist, basically I don't believe that's ever going to hit. And uh, basically if you're, if you're interested in some of my, uh, where I'm getting my resources for today, one of them is at Mises. This one is from Ray Harvey. It's uh, on Mises Daily Articles from two th from uh, July eighth of two thousand nine, called Winter Nuclear. We also have this one is from uh, Audubon, from uh, uh, Emma Bryce, uh, May sixteenth of two thousand sixteen, uh, called Will Wind Turbines Ever Be Safe for Birds. And this one is from uh, Wildlife Leadership Academy from, uh, uh, who is this? Uh, it says by Academy Director. It's actually, uh, it's actually a blog written by uh, Sean, a former uh, drummer student. Uh, and he, explain, he actually goes over the actual negative uh, points of it, of the hydroelectric dam. He goes actually, uh, over pretty well 
with the uh, different things with uh, within, then obviously we understand what else it causes uh, with that. And he goes over the different species that get Im impacted. And that's about it. If you like, if you like this, uh, like, subscribe, click the notification bell. Make sure that you uh, check out my Patreon page and uh, tell others about it uh, where it's at. And that's about it. And I will do my nightly uh, live stream. Haven't decided a topic yet, but uh, that will basically be decided as I go with whatever news tends to hit. Bye, everyone.